You turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to be reading from several verses from 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll be looking at the story of David and Goliath, but I really want to look more at how two people in this text both relate to Goliath and the two different perspectives that are seen from these two people as they relate to Goliath because I believe it says something to us about sometimes how we face our giants. Uh, so in 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning in verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Succoth in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damin between Succoth and Azekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed six hundred shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And on hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now moving a few, chapter, a few verses down. Now Jesse said to his son David, Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit and see how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. So early in the morning David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things, and the keeper of supplies ran to the battle lines and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. And whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. But David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and will fight him. You bow with me in prayer. God, we thank you for this morning and we thank you for, uh, God, the opportunity to gather and worship this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we've already been able to worship together, and we just pray that now as your word is declared, it might uh, give guidance and direction to us. The Lord, as we face the giants in our lives, we might have the confidence and boldness to face them with assurance of your victory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now, to tell this story, we have to first be introduced to the characters in this story, and there are three main characters in this story. Uh, the first character that we meet is, is the enemy, quite honestly. He's, he's the opposition in the story, the bad guy, and that is Goliath. Now, now we've told the story, we've heard the story over and over and over again, and, and sometimes what happens is, is we lose sight, we lose perspective, we lose the ability to just fully understand how massive, how incredible, how strong how dangerous Goliath would have been because we hear, you know, six and a half cubits and we really can't, can't put that into anything that, that makes sense. So we kind, of, we kind of just hear it and we just move on with the story. And I think that's a wrong thing to do because we underestimate exactly what Goliath looks like. I had the opportunity several years ago, back when we still lived in California, to go to an NBA game 
uh, and to watch the NBA and watch the Lakers play while Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal, was still playing with the Lakers. Now, has anyone ever been to a real NBA game, a live game? See, there's a problem that happens if you're watching the NBA on TV. And the problem with watching the NBA on TV is that you really can't get a scale of what the sizes are of individuals on TV. I mean, if you watch the finals tonight, and you watch the Golden State Warriors play, Steph Curry looks small on TV. You realize Steph Curry is four inches taller than I am, and he looks small. When you're at a real game, you actually get to see how big these men are. And Shaquille O'Neal is the biggest person I have ever seen in real life. Okay? The dude was seven foot one. Depending upon what time of the season it was, he weighed between 350 and 320 pounds. But he was massive. I mean, you know, you, you look up with him like this, and he's just, just this huge, incredible man. And to see someone that size be that quick and, and that agile and that powerful, you understand why he was one of the most dominant players in the NBA, because he was just huge but incredibly massive. He's the biggest person I have ever seen alive. Now, I understand there are bigger people than Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, uh, if anyone got to see the uh, HBO documentary they did on Andre the Giant, I don't know if you saw that uh, documentary, Andre the Giant is bigger than Shaquille O'Neal, okay? Andre the Giant is about seven foot three, probably weighs about 450 pounds. Now, now Andre the Giant was just, I, I wish I could have seen, seen him, quite honestly. But in, the, in this documentary, they were doing an interview with him. And in one of the interviews, he placed his hand over the face of the person who was interviewing him. And his hand didn't cover the man's face. His hand covered his entire head. Literally, he made the guy's head look like a grapefruit. His hands were that big. This guy, was, this guy was the biggest guy you could ever imagine. I, uh, they showed in the documentary of him going and sitting on an airplane. Now you can imagine someone that size trying to fly on airplane seats, right? He literally took up two full airplane seats and he still looked like he was incredibly uncomfortable. You realize that Andre the Giant would be giving up two feet, three inches to Goliath? These doors are seven feet tall. Think about that just for a second. Goliath is going to come through about where the exit sign is. That's how big he is. Nine feet, six inches tall. I mean, he, he, he dunks a basketball by simply raising his hand. Okay? He, he, is, he, is, he is nine feet, six inches tall. His armor... Yeah, the, the breastplate that he is wearing weighs 125 pounds. That doesn't include the weight of his helmet. That doesn't include the weight of his bronze greaves. That doesn't include the weight of his javelin. Do you realize he's carrying more weight in armor and weapons than I weigh? He, 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 he has a spear, and, and he mentions this spear, and I, I want to make sure we understand this. It, it talks about his iron-tipped spear. Now, it's important that you understand this for a couple of reasons. One, historically what is happening at this time is the Bronze Age is ending and the Iron Age is beginning. And as the Iron Age is beginning, there are some cultures that have learned how to forge iron and other cultures that have not. The Philistines are one of those societies and cultures that have learned how to forge iron so they can create iron weapons while the Israelites haven't yet done that, so they're still in the Bronze Age, they're still using bronze weapons, okay? So, so this iron-tipped spear is going to be superior to anything that the Israelites have as far as a weapon goes. Because when this iron spear hits bronze anything, what's going to happen to it? It's going to destroy it. But we're also given the, the size of this iron-tipped spear. It's 15 pounds. Now, an Olympic-sized shot put that Olympians throw in the shot put weighs 16 pounds. The iron-tipped spear
spear of this spear weighs as much as that shot put. Now, by the time you add the shaft to it, the shaft's got to be at least the weight of the spear to have any balance. You're talking about a spear that weighs somewhere around 30 to 35 pounds. I get news for you. If you get hit with a spear that size, it doesn't really matter where it hits you. Okay, it can hit you, you know, right about here, and it's taking your whole arm off. Okay, it can hit your pinky toe, you just lost your leg. If you get hit by this iron tip spear, it really doesn't matter where it hits you, you're gone. You're, it's over. Okay, this is the size of Goliath. You, you can't underestimate him, you can't, you can't diminish him because he would be the most massive the biggest, the strongest, the most powerful person you could imagine. Nine foot six, probably weighing about 500, 600 pounds. This behemoth of a character. Now we have to get into the, the Israelites who, who would be facing Goliath. And the first, the first Israelite we come to is Saul, because Saul is Israelite's king. Now, now not only is Saul Israelite's king, but he would also be Israelite's champion. And see, that really is important because you need to understand when Goliath comes forward, that's the challenge he is making. He is the uh, Philistine champion. He is asking the Israelite champion to come down and fight him so that we can determine which nation will be victorious. Saul is the Israelite's champion. He is the best of the Israelite warriors. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, he is described as a handsome young man it could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else, which means that he is taller by about six inches to a foot than any other Israelite there is. He is the tallest of the Israelite soldiers, but not only is he the tallest, but in 1 Samuel 10, 24, he is described, Samuel refers to Saul when he says to the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Saul literally is the best Israelite warrior there is. He is the strongest, he is the tallest, he is the best, he is the most powerful soldier of all of Israel. When Saul is first king and he hears that the city of Jabesh Gilead has been surrounded by, by the Ammonites, he literally rips his oxen to pieces to take it to the people to recruit them into battle. Now if you can tear an oxen to pieces, you've got to be a pretty tough dude. Saul is the strongest Israelite there is. He is the biggest and the baddest of the Israelites. But when he sees Goliath, he is terrified. Terrified of Goliath. Well, that brings us to our third character, David. David, well, David wouldn't strike you as the warrior type. I mean, we are given some descriptions of, of uh, David in, in the Bible. We know that he is the youngest of eight brothers. And because he is the youngest of eight brothers, he kind of falls in the pecking order as the last. Uh, in fact, his own brothers in his family consider so little of David that when the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 16 comes to uh, possibly anoint the next king of Israel, they don't even invite David to the feast. Okay, They leave him in the field with the sheep while all of them are presented before Samuel as a possible replacement for Saul as the king. David is not really known as a great warrior. However, we are given a physical description of David. That physical description of David is found in 1 Samuel 16 and 12. He is described as having beautiful eyes. Now... I, that, that, if you're a girl and you're describing your boyfriend, that's a great description to have. He's got beautiful eyes. But I'm not sure when we talk about warriors, this is what you're really looking for. You know, you know I can imagine someone coming up to King Saul and saying, Hey Saul, we found someone who's willing to fight uh, Goliath. And Saul asked him, well, well, what can you tell me about him? Well, he's got beautiful eyes. You know, that really doesn't strike confidence in me that he's going to be the man that can go forward and fight and kill Goliath. But yet, David is insulted by Goliath and ready to fight him. David not only is insulted by Goliath and ready to fight him, but confidently goes before Saul ready to fight Goliath. 
Now, what is it that is the difference between these two men? Because you understand Goliath hasn't changed. He's the same hulking, huge, nine foot six beast of a man that Saul sees and that David sees. What is the difference between the two of them? How do each man view this situation so radically different? What is it about these two men and their perspectives that changes how they see Goliath? Because there are two very clearly different perspectives seen between Saul and David. Now I think one of the differences is, is that for Saul, Saul has always been the biggest and the strongest and the toughest. That's how Saul is described in Scripture. And because he's always been the biggest and strongest and the toughest, he's used to going into any fight he's ever been in as the favorite. He's used to going into any fight he's ever been in as the one who should win. He's never been in a situation where he's the underdog. He's never been in a situation where he is outmatched. He's never been in a situation where he's not the favorite. And, and when he comes up against Goliath, suddenly that's incredibly unnerving. It's incredibly terrifying because when you're used to being the biggest, when you're used to being the strongest, when you're used to being the toughest, when you're used to being the best, when you're put in a situation where you're not, sometimes you don't know how to handle that situation. And it happens quite often. It happens with, with high school students all the time. We had a high school graduation this week. And, and awfully excited about all of our graduates who graduated. And awfully excited about their future as they get ready to move into college. But, but every year it occurs... You've got a high school student who was the smartest kid in his school. He was the smartest kid around. He valedictorian. He made good grades. School kind of came easy to him. Grades kind of came easy to him. He never really had to study for a test. He gets on a college campus, and he's just another smart kid. And the first class he gets into is some kind of neurochemistry class, a subject matter that he doesn't really understand, and he doesn't know how to handle being the smartest kid in school anymore. Happens to athletes as well. Kid's the best player on his team. He's the best player uh, in the school. He's used to being the best athlete. He's used to being the strongest and the fastest athlete. He gets a college scholarship and he shows up on college and he's just another athlete. And he doesn't know how to handle it when he's no longer the biggest and the strongest and the best. It not only happens to individuals, it can happen to businesses. Oh, yeah, it can happen to businesses. When I was a kid, I was told that if you want to invest in something, you need to invest money in the big three. And the big three at that time were Ford, Chrysler, and General, money, uh, General Motors, because that's what you should invest your money in. I'm glad I didn't take that advice, by the way. But at that time, Ford, Chrysler, and General Motors, they were the biggest auto companies out there. And they really didn't know what to do when Toyota and Honda and Nissan came along. But it's not only individuals that this can happen to. It's not only businesses that this can happen to. It can happen to churches. Churches can get used to being the biggest church on the block. You know, there was a time when First Baptist didn't have to recruit for vacation Bible school. We just announced the date. And every other church in Gilmer would clear their calendar. Because if First Baptist is having VBS, there's no use trying to compete. All we got to do is announce it and kids will come. What happens when you're no longer the biggest church on the block? Oftentimes, we don't know how to respond when we're no longer the favorite. When we're no longer the biggest. David, on the other hand, David is used to being the underdog because David has been the underdog his entire life. David has always been the underdog. David's the youngest of eight. We already established that. I can tell you the first people he fought in his life were his brothers because if you've got a brother, you know it happens. How often do you think David was the favorite when he fought his older brothers? They were all older than him. They were all bigger than him. He's always been the underdog. Every fight he's ever been in, he's been in the underdog. As David uh, tells Saul, and as he starts talking about Saul, about getting ready to fight Goliath, he mentions that he's fought a lion and a bear. 
Do you think he was the favorite in either one of those fights? I don't think so. David has been the underdog in every situation he's been into. He's been used to facing opponents that are bigger and stronger than him. He's been used to facing challenges that are greater than he is. So when he sees Goliath, quite honestly, Goliath is just another giant. Been there, done that. I mean, he's already fought and killed a bear. How much worse can Goliath be than a bear? See, see when you've been the underdog your entire life, you don't really see the, the, the giant as big and as bad and as dangerous as other people do. We were talking with Taylor after our first semester of college, and she was home for college break, and she was talking about how all of her friends were saying, boy, college is so hard, and boy, oh, i got to study all the time, and man, this is just really, really hard work. And she said, man, I had to study in high school. High school was tough for me, so it really wasn't a big transition. See, when you're used to being the underdog, there's something to be said about facing the enemy. But it's not just their perspectives that are different. See, both men have a different lens under which they view Goliath as well. Y'all remember this dress? This is the famous what color is this dress dress. Everybody remember this dress? This is the dress that broke the internet. This is the dress that created controversies among friends and families everywhere. This is the dress that made people absolutely convinced that their wife or husband was colorblind. This is the, is this a blue or black dress? Is this a white and gold dress? Remember this controversy? It just came up recently when we had this Yanny Laurel debate going on. Uh, but, but this dress and the controversy over this dress it created a storm everywhere. Because everybody knows that this is a gold and white dress. Except those who are absolutely convinced that this is a blue and black dress. And the reality is, and what they've, they've determined, uh, you, you listen to psychologists talk about this, is the way you view this dress and the way that you view the color of this dress, because this dress doesn't change color, but the way you view this dress has to do with your life experience, how you've interpreted data, and how you view data in your brain, and how that data then is determined by what you see. In other words, your perspectives and your life experiences shape the lens through which you see this dress. Now this is important because the lens with which we view the world shapes how we see the world. Now in a very little oral sense, anyone who has glasses understands this. I wake up in the morning and look at the alarm clock and I see red blobs. I put on my glasses and those red blobs become numbers. Anyone who has glasses, anyone who uses contacts is aware of that. These Two men, Saul and David, both have a lens that they're using to look at Goliath. Saul sees Goliath through the lens of self. Because Saul's life has always been about self. It's always been about himself. He's viewed every situation through the lens of self. Saul goes into battle uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 15. He goes to fight the Amalekites. God calls Saul to uh, fight the Amalekites. He tells them to destroy the entire nation, destroy their animals, and kill their king. Saul goes into battle. He destroys the Amalekites. He disobeys God because he keeps the animals alive and he keeps the king alive. But more importantly, when Samuel goes to confront Saul about what he's done, the Bible said that Saul went to Carmel to build a monument to himself. Not to God, but to himself. Saul's whole life has been about honoring himself, looking at situations through, by himself. Saul is a man who has always seen things through the lens of self. And when he sees Goliath, that lens tells him immediately, there's no way I can defeat this giant. See, through the lens of self, through his own lens, he can't, he can't defeat Goliath. Goliath is too big, he's too mighty, he's too powerful to, to defeat or face. David, on the other hand, David has viewed all his life through the lens of faith. He's seen things through this lens of faith. And because he sees things through the lens of faith, he has a completely different perspective. 
Listen to David as he talks to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and 37. David said, The Lord, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. See, David is able to see this situation through God's eyes and through the lens of God and through his faith, and therefore he realizes he won't go into battle by himself, but with God. Even a better description is found following. Then David said to the Philistine when he actually approached Goliath, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and He will deliver you into our hands. See, David understands that through faith and through God and through the ability to rely upon and trust in God, he can gain victory over this giant. And the last thing I want to say is there's a truth found in this text. And there's a very important truth found in this text. And the truth is, is that both men are right. Don't miss that. Both men are correct. Saul is absolutely correct. Saul will never defeat Goliath. He could face Goliath a hundred times. He would lose to Goliath a hundred times. Because through his lens, through his own might, through his own ability, through his own strength, he will never defeat be able to defeat the giant. I don't know if there's a giant in your life, but if there is a giant in your life, you've probably discovered by now that you can't defeat him. I ask guys who come into the mission, I, I ask them, uh, that come into a class and I'll ask them, how many of you have just wanted to make it through one day sober? You woke up in the morning and just thought, if I can just make it through the day sober, if I can just make it through the day without taking a drink, without hitting the pipe, if I can just make it through the day without, without shooting up, if I can just make it through one day sober. How many of you have wished that before? Every guy raised their hand. How many of you went to bed that night drunk or high? Every single guy raised their hand again. Because their addiction is a giant they cannot defeat. Their addiction is a giant that they will lose to every single time. I don't know if there's a giant like that in your life. But if there is, you know you can't defeat that giant. But David? David is also absolutely correct. Because David cannot lose to Goliath. David could go and fight Goliath a hundred times, he would win a hundred times. Because David understands with God, all things are possible. David understands with God, he is able to gain and will win this victory. He understands that this is not his battle, but the Lord's battle. Those same guys that I asked that question to, how many of you would stay, be able to stay sober on your own? Every one of them raises their hand because they know they can't stay sober on their own. Every one of those guys is living sober and in victory at the mission because they've learned that the battle is the Lord's. They've learned to surrender to God and allow God to, uh, to fight the battle for them that they could never win on their own. See, both men are correct in this text. Saul is correct. He cannot defeat the giant. David is correct. He has the power through Christ to defeat the giant. The question is, which one are you? See, you're going to face giants in your life. We're going to face giants in our life. This church is going to face giants. Will you have the response of Saul? Or will you have the response of David? You don't understand. We can't reach 
those kids in the project. They're, they, 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 there's just too much work to be done. There's just too many kids. There's just no ability to be able to reach them. We can never be able to reach those kids. Or God's calling us into these projects and He's calling us there because we know that through Christ we can transform these kids' lives. You don't understand. We can't reach this community. There's just, it's just uh, man, our world is just so lost and so sinful and so awful. There's no way that we will ever be able to make an impact in this community. Or God has called us to transform Gilmer and th- through His power and by His might, we will be able to. Both statements are true. Because by ourselves, we never will. But through Christ, through Christ, the victory is already won. Would you bow with me in prayer? This morning as we pray and as we have a time of invitation, there are giants facing us all the time. There are giants that surround us. And as we face those giants, the question is, is how do we face them? Do we look through the lens of self and do we become so concerned with self that we become overwhelmed and just like Saul, become panicked and terrified and give up and give in? Just kind of crawl over into a fetal position and die? Or like David, do we stand in faith knowing that the battle is the Lord's? Because the battle is the Lord's, that He will give us the victory. We have an opportunity to respond to God this morning, an opportunity to respond in faith, and we're going to have the altar open if anyone wants to come and just pray at the altar. I'll be up front if anyone wants to pray with me. This is an opportunity for you to, to commit to a, a new walk of faith in Christ. This is an opportunity for you to commit to, to surrendering to, to God, not giving in to the giants that you face. Maybe for you this is a chance to say yes for the very first time in your life to an invitation to Christ. But as we have this time of offering and this time of invitation, as as God speaks and leads in your life, would you respond to Him? Jesus, we love You. We thank You. And thank You for Your great grace in our lives. And God, we know that there are giants all around us. And Lord, we know that we're going to face those giants. So Lord, help us to have... Help us to have that perspective that David had. Help us to have that lens of faith. Help us to be able to see the battles that we could never win on our own. We're able to gain the victory through you. Speak to us and move in our hearts and lives this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Would you stand as we have our hymn of invitation as God speaks, as God leads, this altar is open for you to come to pray. If you'd like to pray with me also.